Uh, last time we were talking about the Jacob stories, which are simply a delight to read. They uh, very clearly lay out the character of, of uh, Jacob in a way that um, is not the case with most of the other ancestral stories we have read. Uh, after all of those Abraham stories, we still don't have a really clear idea of the character of Abraham, except the one point that the Yahwist wants us to take away. He is obedient, that whatever else you say about him, he is obedient. His actions don't look like they uh, involve a lot of thinking or focus or trying to figure out what the results of his actions might be, uh, but he is at least obedient. And the uh, Yahwist writer seems to be interested and exploring now different relationships that might exist between God and human beings. And uh, certainly Abraham's obedience is a nice change from what went on in the primeval history in chapters 1 through 11 of Genesis, but looked at in terms of its results and the possibility of it going terribly wrong which is the way that the Yahweh seems to be using the binding of Isaac's story in chapter 22, uh, it probably is not what God really wants in the way of a divine human relationship. And so uh, the uh, stories about uh, uh, Isaac are minimal. Uh, Isaac really doesn't contribute anything to this development. But Jacob will. Jacob is going to be a much more fully fleshed out character. And we've already seen that in the stories about his stealing of the birthright from his brother Esau, uh, who should have been the firstborn, uh, but that birthright was stolen, or not, it's not stolen, that, that is uh, maybe Isaac or uh, uh, Esau's view of it. But it was purchased, let's say, uh, in an extreme situation, uh, Esau being a basic person uh, is mostly worried about his next meal and so he um, sells his birthright uh, to his brother. And uh, then his brother manages to steal the ancestral blessing. Uh, and at the uh, end of that narrative, you remember the, the uh, Two brothers begin a feud which is going to last through at least the beginning part of the Jacob Esau stories. And in order to avoid uh, a possible unpleasant and p fatal encounter with Esau, Jacob decides to leave town and he goes over to take refuge with the family of his mother. And so we begin, and, we, and that's where we left off the discussion last time, we begin with the Jacob Laban stories. And here for the first time, Jacob meets a character who is just as crafty and clever as Jacob himself is. He has never met anyone quite like this. Esau was somebody who was very easy to fool, uh, somebody who was basically a go-along, get-along guy. And he uh, really did not overthink his life. Uh, he, had, he was strong, he was a person of the backwoods, but he doesn't ever figure out his brother and how to deal with his brother. Uh, that's going to be very different in the Laban stories. The, Laban immediately recognizes a kinsperson in Jacob in the sense that here is somebody who is a worthy opponent. He is somebody who's uh, just as clever as uh, Laban himself is. We have not yet seen an example of that, but we are about to without losing any time uh, in the narrative. The, uh, as soon as Jacob has been introduced to the family of Laban and in a very brief period of time fallen in love with the younger daughter of Laban, Rachel, uh, he decides that he wants to marry her. He has no uh, bride price to pay to Laban because he doesn't have anything. 
He got out of town with his skin, and that's about it. So uh, he makes a deal with uh, Laban to contract a marriage. Uh, Laban does so, although he doesn't seem terribly excited about the possibility. Uh, and um, Laban has uh, agreed that Jacob can work for him for a period of time. And that gets transmuted into a marriage arrangement. This is the end of chapter 29. So Jacob loved Rachel, and he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. And Laban says, with great enthusiasm, it is better that I give her to you than I should give her to anyone else. He doesn't really seem terribly excited about this, but it'll do uh, in a pinch. So you can stay with me. So Jacob served uh, seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love that he had for her. This is the obvious at, 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 its, at its best uh, in this use of words that he, and notice how quickly these seven years pass in the narrative. They're gone. And we're now wed ready for the wedding. Uh, the wedding is going to be as it typically seems to be, uh, according to the Samson stories, which we'll get to later, a week-long affair uh, in which there is much drinking and um, it is the time when finally the married couple can get together, as it were. And so <clears throat> Laban gathered all the men of the place and made a feast. But in the evening, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and he went in to her. So Laban gave the maid Zilpah to his daughter Leah to be her maid. And in the morning, what do you know? When they woke up, it was Leah, <laughs> not Rachel. Uh, needless to say, Jacob is upset. And so he goes to his now father-in-law who, uh, he says, you know, didn't we make a deal for Rachel? Wasn't that what? Oh, I forgot to mention that. Uh, we don't marry the younger daughter before we marry off the older daughter. Uh, funny that I let that slip my attention. Um, so round one goes to Laban in this uh, discussion. And uh, so it, then he says, good uh, used car salesman that he is, I'll tell you what I'll do for you. I'll let you work another seven years for Rachel, but I will give her to you now. So you don't have to wait until the end of another seven years. What a bargain that <laughs> is. So uh, that's the deal that they finally conclude. He winds up with both of Laban's daughters uh, and and a very sore grudge against Laban for the whole business. Uh, the uh, narrative now indulges in what seems to be typical for these ancestral stories, and that is the problem of the barren matriarch. And we've already seen this uh, introduced big time in the Abraham story, where uh, Sarah was barren for a very, very long time. And finally, only under divine guidance was she able in old age to bear the son who would bear the promise. Uh, and here again, we're going to have the same motif running through the stories. Leah, the one who is not favored by Jacob, is going to be the one who will bear children to Jacob. And it takes a very long time for Rachel eventually to bear two children. Uh, one of them finally, after the others have been born, who will be Ephraim, and the other uh, will be the youngest, Benjamin, who will play a role in the Joseph story and uh, be one of the major tribal groups. Uh, there is a lot of background tribal material in this story, which we won't go into. Uh, they are busily trying to not only tell you about the origin of the 12 or 13 tribes of Israel, 
and the names that are given to them, and there is, in typical uh, Yahwist style, an etymology for all of these names, and they will tell you, you know, what they mean and what the significance of them is. These are quite fanciful folk etymologies. This theme will come up again in the Joseph story, and the trying to sort out the rankings of the tribes, and the book of uh, Genesis ends in chapter 49 with a long, fairly old, uh, poetic set of blessings on the individual uh, tribes. So there is a lot of tribal material here that seems to be interested in ranking the tribes relative to each other. And uh, you don't need to worry too much about that, but if you ever want to try to uh, figure out what goes on later, and the significance of the tribes and so on, you need to, to uh, try to sort out what these uh, tribal relationships really are. In the meantime, uh, Jacob has now two wives and is beginning to have a family, but he still does not have any wealth, so he makes an agreement with Laban. Uh, and the agreement is that uh, he will keep, he, uh, Jacob, will keep out of Laban's flock all of the multicolored animals among the goats and the sheep. Now this story is very, very complicated. There is no theological value to it whatsoever. It is simply a hilarious story. Uh, enjoy it. Uh, don't try to get too much out of it. Uh, and it is a very complicated story uh, because there are things that they would have known that you do not know. And what you do not know is that in that period to this, uh, and, uh, to this day in uh, the Levant, sheep mostly are white. Uh, once in a while you get an odd black sheep. And goats are mostly black. And you will see that uh, to this day in the black tents of the Bedouin uh, who encamp still around the fringes of various settled Israelite areas. Um, you can see Bedouin encampments uh, fairly easily if you go over there and visit. And they still leave, uh, live in these black goatskin tents. The uh, tents are black because this, they leave the hair of the skin of the goat on the the uh, material when they make the tent, and so the tents are black. And there are poetic references from antiquity to the black tents of the Bedouin. So they've been doing this for a really very long time. So uh, most goats are black, and the deal is going to be that Jacob will take the um, multicolored ones and make that his wages for taking care of the animals. And the, the pure colored ones, whether white or black, will be the property of Laban. So to begin the game, uh, without warning, Laban goes through the herd and culls out any of the multicolored animals, which reduces the chance that either the sheep or the goats will not breed true to form. And that makes it a lot harder for these animals to become multicolored. And that means that the chances that Jacob is gonna get much out of this breeding program are minimal. Uh, so Jacob has to do something and what he does and here we are heading off into Never Never Land. These people are, do not have any clear idea of modern genetics. Uh, so they don't know uh, how you breed a multicolored. And so what Jacob does is to get some black twigs. And he strips the bark off of them to create white stripes on the black twigs. And whenever the sheep come to the watering trough or to the food bin to be fed, uh, when they are white, he puts these black and white um, rods in place near the watering trough. 
And the sheep, apparently, at least the strong sheep, uh, when they breed, will look at these things and miraculously breed multicolored. Uh, the same trick works on the goats. The goats are black, and white blotches and stripes will be introduced onto the strong goats. He's careful to do this in selective breeding only with strong animals, not with weak animals. So what is left after uh, this experiment has gone on for a while is a bunch of really healthy, strong, multicolored goats and sheep, and Laban is left with the sickly animals and the ones that are single colored uh, where uh, Jacob did not try to do this selective breeding. Uh, Laban, of course, has no idea what is going on here. All he knows is that his flock is decreasing and it's not very healthy in the bargain, whereas Jacob's uh, flock is doing really well and he's got nice, healthy sheep and goats. Uh, so that's the story. Uh, I'm sticking by it. It's here. You can read it and make of it what you will. I think even in antiquity, they knew that this was just a very funny story. <laughs> and they probably enjoyed uh, in Israel telling this story about how their ancestor uh, managed to take advantage of these Aramaic speakers who remained a thorn in the side of Israel all the way down into the monarchical period in the Northern Kingdom. So there is no love lost for the Arameans uh, in the North among the Israelites. So don't, just enjoy the story. Uh, don't try to make too much out of it. Uh, in short, uh, the children are being born to Jacob. He's beginning to get a large family. He's now got wealth in the form of animals, and herds, and uh, his uh, wives, Laban's daughters, decide that they are not happy with uh, the way things are going there, that they really want to leave. Uh, and so one night they decide to take off, uh, taking with them some more of Laban's possessions, including his household deities. Um, this is an indication of worship life among the Arameans at the time. We won't go into that. That's irrelevant to the story. Um, but as they, uh, they are not able to get completely away, they're headed back to uh, Jacob's side of the Jordan. They're headed west. And... Uh, <laughs> Jacob gets a divine message from Yahweh, uh, which uh, talks about all of this increase in his wealth being God's direct doing. Uh, so Jacob arose and uh, set his sons and wives on camels. This is chapter 31 now. And drove away all of his cattle, all his livestock, which he had gained, and cattle in his possession. This Translation, this is RSV uh, version one that I'm reading you, uh, which uses cattle as in the English sense of any kind of small animal. Uh, that is cattle. It's not technically cattle. He's not become a cattle herder. Um, <clears throat> and he, goes, he wants to go back to the land of uh, Canaan to his father Isaac, who of course has died. And we should know that and so should he. Uh, Laban had gone to shear the sheep, and Rachel stole her father's household gods. Jacob outwitted Laban, the Aramean, in that he did not tell him that he intended to flee. And so he fled with everything that he had, and he arose and he crossed the Euphrates and set his face toward the hill country of Gilead. And when it was told to Laban on the third day, so Jacob's got a three-day run on him, uh, that Jacob had fled, he took his kinsmen with him and pursued them for seven days and followed close after him into the hill country of Gilead. But God came to Laban the Aramean in a dream and said, be careful, don't say a word to Jacob, either good or bad, which pretty much 
uh, exhausts all of the possibilities, right? <laughs> uh, so don't say anything. This is, this is a similar construction to the tree of knowledge of good and evil, good and evil knowledge. So it's a total, total knowledge tree. Uh, similarly, this is a warning not to say anything provocative to uh, Jacob. So Laban overtook Jacob. Now Jacob had pitched his tent in the hill country and Laban with his kinsmen encamped in the hill country of Gilead. And Laban said to Jacob, what have you done that you have cheated me and carried away my daughters like captives of the sword? Why did you flee secretly and cheat me? Why did you not tell me so that I might have sent you away with mirth and songs and tambourine and the lyre? Sure, he would have. <laughs> Uh, he's trying another round of this, but it's not going to work this time. Why did you not permit me to kiss my sons and my daughters farewell? Now you have done foolishly. It is in my power to do you harm, but God, the God of your father spoke to me last night, saying, Be careful that you speak with Jacob, neither good nor bad. So now you have gone away because you longed for your father's house. But why did you steal my gods? Jacob answered Laban, because I was afraid. And I thought that you would take your daughters from me by force. So they're having a pretty good argument here. Anyone with whom you find your gods shall not live. In the presence of our kinsmen, point out what I have that is yours and take it. Now Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen them. So Laban went into Jacob's tent and into Leah's tent and into the tent of the two maidservants, but he did not find the gods. And he went out of Leah's tent and entered Rachel's tent. Now Rachel had taken the household gods and put them in the camel saddle and sat on it. And Laban felt all around the tent, but did not find them. And she said to her father, let not my Lord be angry that I cannot rise before you, for the way of women is upon me. And so he searched, but he did not find the household gods. There are many stories of this sort. We'll see others in the uh, uh, story about the birth of Moses. Uh, this is the way people without great power are able to do things in a society like this. It's a way of outwitting the foxes. And so it's, uh, it's an interesting story. It's a funny story, uh, which will resonate. Uh, so Jacob became angry, and he upbraided. Now it's his turn to be angry. Jacob said unto Laban, What is my offense? What is my sin that you have hotly pursued me? Although you have felt through my goods, what have you found in all your household goods? Set it here before my kinsmen and your kinsmen, that they may decide between the two of us. These 20 years, now he, this here is his complaint. These 20 years I have been with you. Your ewes and your he goats have not miscarried. I have not eaten the rams of your flock. What um, was torn by wild beasts I did not bring to you. Um, under herding contracts of the period, of which we have a few, um, if he had brought the torn animals to the owner, uh, they would not have been counted against him uh, because they would have been taken by li lions or wolves or whatever. And he was not, the shepherd was not responsible for those. But he said he bore the loss of those himself. Of my hand you required it. That is, the contract that he struck with uh, Laban did not allow for this nicety, which was a standard in most herding contracts. Thus I was by day, and uh, heat consumed me, and cold by night, and my sleep fled from my eyes. These twenty years I have been in your house. I served you fourteen years for your two daughters, six years for your flock, and you have changed my wages ten times. That's probably an exaggeration, but that's what he comes up with. Uh, if the God of my father, the God of Abraham, the fear of Isaac, had not been on my side, surely now you would have sent me away empty-handed. God saw my affliction and the labor of my hands and rebuked you last night. Then Laban answered and said to Jacob, The daughters are my daughters, the children are my children, the flocks are my flocks, everything you see is mine. 
But what can I do this day to these my daughters or to their children whom they have borne? Come now, let us make a covenant, you and I. Let it be a witness between you and me. And so Jacob took a stone and set it up as a pillar. We've seen this before in the scene at Bethel, where it becomes a sacred object, which is going to be a marker uh, for the a relationship between the two of them. And Jacob said to his kinsmen, gather stones, and they took stones and made a heap. And they ate there by the heap. So there is a cultic meal that takes place next to this pile of stones. And Laban called the name of the place Yagar Sadutha, which is an Aramaic phrase. The only Aramaic quotation we have from him. The rest of it is in Hebrew. Apparently in the other stories he is portrayed as speaking Hebrew. Here he gives it an, an Aramaic name, which simply means the heap or pile of the witness. Uh, but Jacob called the place in Hebrew Gal Aid, which means exactly the same thing, the heap of the witness. And this heap is a witness between you and me today. Therefore they named it Gal Aid and the pillar Mizpah, for he said, may the Lord watch between the two of us when we are absent from each other. This is so often taken out of context. In its context, literarily, it clearly means be careful what you do. This pile of stones is an indication that God is watching the two of us to make sure that we do not transgress the boundary between the two. Um, so it's a good example of treaty making uh, between two individuals. We haven't seen many examples of this yet. Uh, and in this case, it, it becomes a permanent marker between the Aramean speakers in the north and the Hebrew speakers um, to the uh, west. And the um, break between the uh, two lineages that are joined in the uh, ancestral stories. Uh, those now come apart. Uh, early in the morning, Laban arose, kissed his grandchildren and daughters, and blessed them, and then he departed and returned home. Things seemed to be going uh, well for Jacob. Um, so Jacob sent messengers to him, or to Esau, his brother, in the land of Seir, that is Edom, instructing them, thus you shall say to my Lord, this is your servant Jacob, I have sojourned with Laban, and stayed until now. I have oxen, asses, flocks, men servants, maid servants, and now I have sent to tell my Lord in order that I may find favor in your sight. So he's ready now to try to make up with his brother uh, Esau. Uh, and uh, it does not look good. News is eventually um, brought from messengers to Jacob, returning his message from Esau. We came to your brother Esau, and he is coming to meet you, and 400 men with him. <laughs> that was something that Jacob had not anticipated. Uh, he's very worried about this, to put it mildly, and so he devises a scheme, which is to divide his possessions into groups and he sends these along with his relatives to go out in waves to meet Esau, figuring in typical Jacob-like way that at least maybe he will survive uh, even if the rest of his household does not. This is a um, scheme that he probably should not have tried, although in the end uh, he gets away with it as he does with much else. Uh, he sends them across the Jabbok River. They are uh, about to cross the Jabbok. And at night, he sends the animals and the relatives across the river to where they will eventually encounter Esau. And he himself is left on the side of the Jabbok. Uh, so this is 3222. 
The same night he arose and took his two wives and his maids and his eleven children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. And he took them and sent them across the stream and likewise everything that he had. And Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. There is no introduction to this whatsoever, this experience that he has. Uh, like his experience with the three men on their way to uh, destroy Sodom and the Abraham story, uh, here also this man turns out to be more than a man. This is the Yahwist at his best, talking about personal uh, appearances of the deity in which the deity is capable of being mistaken for a man. And so the two of them wrestle together. And he said, I'm sorry, uh, when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and Jacob's thigh was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. And then he said, that is the man said, let me go for the dawn is breaking. And Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you let you go unless you bless me. And so the man said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob, that was a dumb thing to say. Now the man knows his name and you can easily compound a curse instead of a blessing. It's a sign of vulnerability that you now have the name and you can control the individual whose name you have. Uh, Jacob, uh, without thinking, gives him the name. In this case, it does result in a blessing uh, and it uh, turns out to be important in the narrative. Then the man said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel which is here now interpreted for you to mean the one who wrestles with God. Because you have wrestled with God and with human beings and you have succeeded. Jacob knows that he has won. He calls the name of the place Peniel, meaning the face of God. Because, he explains, I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been preserved. And so, as the sun rose upon him, as he passed Peniel, limping because of his thigh. He has had a wrestling match with the deity, and this will be the way in which Israel, in these ancestral stories now, considers itself to be related to that deity. This is the relationship that will characterize Israel and will be the reason for the name change that takes place at this point. Uh, Jacob has wrestled the deity to a draw and both of them are forever changed. The Jacob will always limp as a reminder of what has happened that night. And the deity now has a new way of talking about this relationship. Uh, Esau eventually re-enters the story. Jacob uh, makes peace with Esau. Esau goes along with it. The two of them are, or Esau invites Jacob to go with him together so that they may go back together and Jacob again says, well, uh, you go ahead. I will uh, follow after you. The young of the livestock can't move very quickly. The children cannot move very quickly. Uh, so I'll, I'll catch up with you. So Esau goes his way, and Jacob turns around and goes in the opposite direction. Uh, true to the end. Uh, in his relationship between the two. So we have a picture here of a very different kind of ancestor and one which obviously resonated uh, very strongly. 
the deity, with a couple of exceptions, the deity, remember, has made two direct appearances in here, one at Beit El and one at Paniel. Uh, both of them lead to new things in the life of Jacob. But there really is very little control exercised by the deity in this story. Uh, Jacob, the malleable opportunist, survives mostly by his wits with occasional help from the deity. He's more or less on his own and independent. And this seems to be the way that the Israel of the Yahwist wanted itself to be remembered. This story is followed immediately by the Joseph story, which is the longest of the stories about the ancestors. Uh, it is usually considered to be a novella, that is, a short uh, novel. And it has all of the characteristics of a novel. Uh, we see plot development in there. We see the development of characters. We see a lot of use of dialogue between the uh, participants. Uh, it comes uh, out of an Egyptian background. The writer of the story seems to be familiar with Egypt and how Egypt operated. Exactly why that was the case, we do not know. Uh, but the Egyptian background is obvious in the story, and you can pick that up from your reading. The uh, story itself is usually attributed to the Yahwist, I'm sorry, to the Eloist, but that's more or less a council of despair. Uh, they rule out the Yahwist, they rule out the priestly writer, it's certainly not the Deuteronomist. Uh, so it must be the Eloist. That's sort of how they get to the identification of the Eloist in this story. The type of story is one that is easily recognizable from um, modern fiction. It is a, a coming of age story. And this is the first time we have really seen one uh, in our uh, ancestral stories. The um, story about Abraham does not show any major character development. At the end of the story, he is just the same way that he is at the beginning of the story. He is faithful to, uh, in his obedience to God's command, and that's about all you can say about him. That character trait is the most obvious one, and it remains throughout the entire story. Uh, we don't know enough about Isaac to know what his character might look like, but Jacob is also someone who is consistent in the way his character operates. And you see it every time he puts his hand to something, uh, there is this element of trickery involved in what he is doing. And so uh, that uh, character is a stable character also within the narrative. With Joseph, we actually have a story of someone who begins as an annoying kid uh, who has a lot of older brothers who really cannot abide him. It's a typical family kind of story where the, he's the one uh, who tags along after people and gets in the way and annoys the older brothers. Uh, he also has the misfortune to be the favorite of his father. And his father uh, shows that favoritism by not expecting him to do anything and by giving him a uh, cloak that is distinctive. We don't know exactly what the words mean. Uh, multicolored or something is the usual guess uh, leading to the traditional coat of many colors, but we really don't know. Uh, it's a katonet pasim. It's the same phrase that is used of the daughters of the king in the David story who wear this kind of a garment. Uh, the current trend is, if you're following different translations, is to view it as a a cloak with long sleeves. I don't know why that would be particularly distinctive, but in any case, uh, the story turns on that as a symbol of everything that the brothers dislike about this young kid. He doesn't work. He is, as we would say, flow, slow to fledge. His father doesn't expect him to work and lets him sit around the house all day. 
He has dreams, which will eventually be a problem for him because he not only has them, he tells them to people. And the people don't like the import of the dreams. It doesn't require anything much to interpret what the dreams are supposed to mean. And it has to do with his own superiority over his brothers. And they are not happy to get that message. And so um, he is separated from his brothers as symbolized by this garment that he is given by his father. And that becomes the symbol of the difference between him and them. Uh, the story, of course, is one that you know, and I invite you to read it. it. There is wonderful detail in this story, particularly in the way that he interacts with the other characters, eventually rising to the position of being a, a major force in the Egyptian governmental hierarchy. Uh, number two, only to Pharaoh. So the story, however, improbably, becomes an example of a story that we know from elsewhere, uh, mostly from the uh, book of Daniel. Uh, you get hints of it also in the book of Esther. And it deals with a theme that was quite popular in the later Second Temple period, namely the theme of how Israel is to exist in a foreign land. And the message is very clear that if you play your cards right and assimilate to a certain degree without losing your religious identity, you can do well because foreigners will respect good work uh, uh, no matter who you are. That's the message. And so Daniel in the story, uh, the Israelites have risen to positions in the bureaucracy and Daniel himself, every time he comes up with one of these dream interpretations uh, that is uh, useful to the king, uh, whether it's the Persian king or the Babylonian king, is rewarded by being promoted in the bureaucracy. It's an example of doing uh, good and doing well by doing good. So he, um, it, it becomes an example of how you get along in a foreign uh, land, and it does uh, raise the question about the identity of Israel. In this, this, that's one of its functions in the current uh, location. So the question is now this. Uh, Israel, at the end of the patriarchal ancestral narratives, has become uh, a partial fulfillment of the promise that was made to Abraham. They have now become a mighty nation. They are a lot of people. And therefore, they have, you could argue, have fulfilled that portion of the ancestral promise. On the other hand, the land which they inherit now is Egypt. Is Egypt going to be the place where the promise is fulfilled? Is that the message we are supposed to take away from the Joseph story? You should keep that in mind because it's going to be the same pro uh, problem that will be raised at the beginning of the book of Exodus. Is Egypt the place where Israel is to make its home? Uh, things seem to be doing quite well in the Joseph story. The, uh, Israelites who are brought down there to be part of, uh, ja um, are, well, they're, they're all sons of Jacob and they're part of Joseph's family. But is that going to be the land which God promised to the Israelites? So there is a kind of way in which that piece of the promise is not fulfilled yet. The promise of land is still to be addressed in the narrative. And the uh, book of Genesis ends with the suggestion that maybe it should be Egypt. We'll see that that's not going to be the way that it works out. Notice the uh, dwelling of the story on the assimilation of the Israelites into the local culture. Joseph has so far assimilated into Egyptian culture 
that his own brothers mistake him for an Egyptian. And that theme is going to come up again with Moses, that he is not recognized by his own people as one of them. So this question of identity is being raised in the narrative. Uh, Joseph speaks Egyptian in the presence of his brothers, as one would expect when these foreigners come into the Egyptian royal court. You would expect them to be speaking Egyptian. Uh, there are references to needing to translate. The brothers speak to themselves in Hebrew. There is a, a recognition of the different languages, that they are not part of the Egyptian culture. Uh, they speak to themselves in Hebrew, assuming that uh, Joseph does not understand them. And of course he does. And the story will turn on that kind of confusion. But notice how many of these identity problems are being raised at the end of the story. Theologically, nothing much is going on in this story. Its main function, to be blunt about it, as nice a story as it is, uh, its main function is to get the Israelites down into Egypt and provide the background for the beginning of the book of Exodus. You can't have a story about Exodus and the going out of Egypt until you get them down there. And so uh, the story is uh, uh, sort of ends with the people down there. We don't know what the uh, role of the deity is in all of this. We have not had any real appearances from the deity in the Joseph story. God plays only a minor role in some of the Jacob stories, but here God doesn't play any role at all. Uh, you don't get any impression of what the author thinks about the deity's intervention or lack of it in the comings and goings of the Israelites in this thing. And the idea that God is interested at all in events only appears at the very end of, the, of chapter 50. Uh, so uh, Joseph in his last speech to his brothers, Joseph in, in verse 19 of chapter 50 says, Joseph said to them, fear not, Am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are to this day. That's the only appearance of the deity in this story. That's 46, uh, I'm sorry, 50, 50 uh, beginning around verse 19 which are the last uh, words. Uh, so Joseph dwelt in Egypt, the narrator goes on, he and his ancestral house, and lived 110 years. And Joseph saw Ephraim's children to the third generation, the children of Machir and so on. And finally, uh, Joseph dies in Egypt. And the rest of the people are left there to make their own way. And that is the po point at which the book of Exodus picks up the story. And that's what we will do on Monday.